9 to 11 and 24 to 26. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal with, with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies of all the truth which you have shown for your servant. For I crossed over the Jordan with my staff and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hands of my brother, for the hands of Esau, for I fear him. Lest he come and attack me and my mother and, and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your, your descendant as the, as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered or multiplied. 24, 26. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day break. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Ever so often you have one of those hymns that really touch you. And uh, hymn number 100 in our hymnal is one of those hymns where it talks about the goodness of God and how he's faithful. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion, they fail not, as thou hast been, thy forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, some moon and stars in their courses above, join with our nature and manifold to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, do mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and the peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings on mine with ten thousands beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, the hand hath provided. Great is the faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Happy Sabbath. I'd like to thank Brother Joseph and Sister Anissa for a, a great duet. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's borrow our heads for a word of prayer.
Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we would like to say thank you. We would like to say thank you for having mercy and grace upon us. We would like to say thank you for being our good shepherd and being our Lord and Savior. We would like to say thank you for all your promises. Thank you for all of the things that you've done for us, even though many times we do not deserve it. We would like to say thank you for allowing us to be in your house of worship here in the land of the living. We would like to say thank you because we here have an opportunity to make sure our calling and election is sure. We'd like to say thank you for us being able to hear your word and receive your word. We'd like to say thank you because we have an opportunity to change our life and make better decisions. We have an opportunity to be better today than we were yesterday. And I pray, dear God, that as we have this conversation and we learn more about you, that we will leave here changed, not just entertained, but really inspired to get more into your word, to learn more about you, and to realize that with you all things are possible. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to ask you, dear God, and ask you, our audience, to listen very intently for where we're going to go and what's about to take place, because it's God's desire for all of us to learn, amen? amen? To be taught and to grow. And many times during church services, we have distractions. You think about different things, but we're going to pray and, and I ask you to pray with me as we go into this lesson here today. Our scripture reading, Sister Clark, thank you for reading it. It's taken from Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to reread this in your hearing. Genesis chapter 32, verses 9 through 12. And Jacob said, O God, my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saith unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. But he says, I am not worthy of the least of all your mercies, and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I pass over this Jordan. Now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me, and the mother with the children. And thou says, I will surely do thee good, and make thy sea as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. There comes a time in a person's life when they are called to take a stand. There comes a time in a person's life where they are called to stop accepting mediocrity. There comes a time in a person's life when a decision is made to accept responsibility. There comes a time in a person's life when a decision is made to accept accountability. There comes a time in a person's life when they decide, I'm not going to compromise anymore. There comes a time in a person's life when a decision is made, I must believe. There comes a time in a person's life where decision is made to have faith beyond one's own resources, abilities, or capabilities. There comes a time in a person's life when decision is made to set aside all doubts, all fears, all worries, all idiosyncrasies, and just have faith. There comes a time in a person's life when they decide enough is enough. I need to make a change. Not just for change's sake, but because I do not wish to continue to live as I've been living. I've been called by God to live at a higher level. A level of purity and integrity. I've been called to live a life as a Christian. As part of God's remnant, commandment, keeping people of believers. One of the mantras should be good, better, best. Never let it rest. 
until your good is better and your better is the best. Upon occasion, there comes a time in a person's life where you must choose what to believe. Your belief cannot and must not exist solely upon your father's experience or your mother's religion. It must be based upon a personal connection and relationship based upon your own personal experiences. This belief must be rooted and grounded in more than just your social status, must be rooted and grounded more than just your job title, must be rooted and grounded more than beyond your family name, even if it's a good one. This belief must be rooted and grounded in more than your paycheck, your wealth, or your portfolio. This belief must be rooted and grounded in more than just your education. For this belief must sustain you through the hurricanes, pitfalls, mountaintops experiences, and the slumps that we all will experience in life. When we last spoke, we learned that God does keep his promises. Through thick and thin, very thin, <laughs> and even the slimmest of circumstances. Amen, Walls. When we last spoke, we begin to understand that God's relationship to time is static when it comes to our character development. Because that relationship with time is static because his objective is the development of our character with relationship to eternity. When we last spoke, we once again discovered that he does keep his promises. After 35 years of praying, after 35 years of hoping and believing, after 35 years of perseverance, Abraham and Sarah finally conceived and received the fulfillment of having a child. Sarah, after being barren for 35 years of first receiving the promise, gave birth to a son. Imagine going to the doctor 35 years in a row Seeking if you're pregnant. They didn't have no pregnancy kits back then. Just imagine that. And just the disappointment of every year, every month, coming back and being told no. But God is faithful. His providence and divine timing is beyond belief. With this blessing, however, came a testing. And one may say, hasn't he been tested enough? But now he receives his promise. Now his dream is fulfilled. He has a son, an heir, a little man that you can look at and talk to and see yourself in, a person that you've imagined, I can teach so many things with and show him things and guide him along the way. I can imagine, I do imagine, I do experience that at times myself. But imagine having received this promise God now asks him to do something that is just simply immeasurably impossible. You see, in the past, Abraham showed at moments a lack of faith, even though he became known as the father of the faithful. Patriarchs and prophets said that Satan continuously accused him that he is not worthy to receive the promises of the covenant. He said he failed to comply with the conditions and was unworthy of the blessing. So God desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heaven, before all the universe. To demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted. And to more openly to display that fully the plan of salvation. This is taken from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 154 and 155. One night when Isaac was a young man, he gave Abraham the hardest test he ever gave a human being. Take now thy son. This is taken from Genesis chapter 22, verse 2, if you'd like to read along. 
It says, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Abraham knew the voice of God, and the voice was clear. Unlike other times where he would reason and vacillate and compromise, this time he didn't hesitate. God had fulfilled a promise that he desired. He did not hesitate to listen to do what was requested of him. If this would have happened today, in the age of Instagram and video pics and cell phone cameras and text messages, Abraham probably would have been charged with child abuse or attempted murder. For they would not know what was requested of him and expected of him to do. Abraham, although he did not understand why God should require this sacrifice, he yet obeyed. You know, the Bible doesn't tell how he snuck out or how he walked out or how he told his wife where he was going. He didn't. I know in my house, if I got up and say, well, hell, I'm going to be back in three days. Michael and I are going to go on a trip. Where are you going? I can't really tell you. <laughs> We're going to go on a journey, though. <laughs> you don't know. You're not going to your mother's house? No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> It'd be a long conversation. Trust me. With Isaac, however, he did not delay, for it took him three days to get to his appointed place. Once they travel, Isaac asks, where is the land for the burnt offering? Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. And Abraham answered, my son, God will provide a land. Amen. You got to understand, Isaac was not just a toddler. Isaac was at the age where he could have resisted. I want you to understand this. Covenant goes from generation to generation. If you see God and your father, you will display God through your son. Understand where I'm going. If you see God and your father, whether you're obedient, a good child, or bad God, bad person, you will see God in your children. It's a promise. It's a promise. It's a promise. God is straight as this aisle. You keep him with me, I'll keep him with you. It's a promise. Isaac could have easily wrestled away. But because his father trusted God, Isaac trusted his father. Got to understand that. My son's not here right now. I'm not going to tell him. Sometimes little people don't like darkness. They don't like to walk in the dark. But if I walk with him, he'll go anywhere. You understand what I'm saying? We went someplace back in Rochester to my uncle's house. It was black as Egypt night. My uncle said, Michael, can you go over there and grab that? He was like, well, I could. But he said, Daddy, can you go with me? And once I stood up, he walked in front of me. Because he had confidence. Got to understand this. Isaac had faith in his father because his father had faith in God. Amen. Together they built an altar and they arranged the wood. Then Abraham explained God's command. And Isaac willingly gave himself and encouraged his father to obey. You got to understand this. He understood what was about to happen. He could have fought and resisted, but he didn't. He understood what was about to take place. He trusted his father because his father trusted and practiced and believed in God. Yes, Sister Connie, I love you. It's not by chance that your daughter called you. 
It's not by chance you said, Mama, I'm sorry. No matter if you go left or right, they will always come back because it's a promise. Can I get a witness? It's a promise. God's word would not return to him void. As Abraham raised the knife to slay his son, a voice called from heaven and said, Abraham. And God directed him not to harm his son. Immediately, Abraham saw a ram caught in the thicket and offered as a sacrifice to God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 155 says, All heaven beheld with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience. For this was it. This was it. So here we go. You see, Satan is the accuser of the brother. And now he couldn't accuse him no more. For he now passed the test. At a hundred and fifth, no, I think the Bible said it was Patriarch Prophet said about 120 years old, 115 years old. He passed the test. This man has been tested since he received the promise at 35, 65, excuse me, received the promise. He's been tested and continue to be tested. We shouldn't expect no less. Genesis chapter 22, verse 12 says, Now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. As a result of this experience, Abraham realized more fully how great the sacrifice of God is. God renewed to Isaac the promise given to his father. His children would inherit the promised land, and the Redeemer would be born of his descendants. When Isaac's twin sons were born, God predicted that Jacob the younger would be the one who would receive the birthright. Genesis 25, verse 23. Let's read that. Genesis chapter 25. Verse 23. Okay, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated by thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and the and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out. And his hand took hold of Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bared them. Jacob saw the practices of his father. Jacob saw the sacrifices and the worship that was taking place, both Jacob and Esau. However, Jacob really wanted the birthright, for he longed to be the one to talk to God. He longed to be the one to communicate with God like Abraham and Isaac had done. He wanted to offer the sacrifices. Esau had no desire for these privileges, but he wanted to double the portion of his father's wealth. According to the American Heritage Dictionary, the birthright is a privilege, first definition is a privilege granted by the virtue of birth. The second definition is a special privilege accorded to the firstborn, the firstborn. Prince Charles, everyone, know, everybody knows who he is? Is the firstborn of Queen Elizabeth II will become king upon her death and inherit all of the realm, 
all of the possessions of the crown that Queen Elizabeth has. I did some research on her. And it did dawn on me, I didn't know this. You learn something new every day, amen? amen. amen. Queen Elizabeth is the largest landowner on earth. You know that? You ready for this? She owns 6.6 .6 billion acres of land. I'll repeat that. 6.6 .6 billion acres of land. Marty was like, wow. <laughs> Let's imagine what that is, where it is. That's all of Canada under the crown of the realm. The United Kingdom under the crown of the realm. Australia under the crown of the realm. 31 under other states and territories. Bermuda under the crown of the realm. Watch where the prince goes on vacation. He's going to one of his homes. <laughs> it's like going through your house and visiting a room every so often. Okay? 6.6 6 billion. The next person closest on the list is King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. 574 million acres. Pale in comparison. Not even close. This is a birthright. This is an inheritance. Now, I want you to walk out of here and say, my grace, she owns all that? Well, you got to understand, there hasn't been a queen of England as we would think of a queen in 300 years. It is owned by the crown. The crown is owned by the realm. And the realm is the United Kingdom of the government. But well, trust me. <laughs> you can look this up because I looked it up. She gets paid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. Under common law, I won't get into that right now. I don't want to put my business hat on. This is Sabbath. <laughs> she gets a little tax. Her face is on the money. <laughs> she gets a tax. A birthright. And I'm explaining this to you because I want you to understand what a birthright is. Typically, if you have a person who's going to inherit land, or a person who has a large family, he would write a will, or she would write a will. They would bequeath certain to the oldest, to the youngest. All depends on how it's being partitioned. You have a trustee. Well, Isaac was Abraham's only son, and therefore he received the birthright by the fact well, he wasn't his only son. Let me change that. He was God-appointed son of a promise because it was told that your wife, Sarah, will be with the legacy and the, leaning, and the legacy of the promise will come through. But Jacob understood the concept of a birthright. Esau understood the benefits of a birthright. Let me just tell you this. Everybody wants the crown, but everybody doesn't want the cost of a crown. Everybody wants the residual benefits of glory, but the, in order to put the work in to receive that glory, everybody doesn't want to pay that price. It costs a lot. Rebecca was told that the younger would rule over the older. But she couldn't see how this would happen. And this is where the story begins. Genesis chapter 27, everybody, New Old Testament. Genesis chapter 27. I'm reading out of the King James Version. Chapter 27, verse 1. And it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and beheld. And he said unto him, Behold, here I am I. 
And he said, Behold now, I am old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, thy bow, excuse me, and go out to the field and take me some venison, and take the savory meat, such as I love, and bring it to me, that I may eat, and that my son may bless thee before I die, that my soul, excuse me, may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah overheard her, her overheard this when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spoke unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory meat that I may eat, and bless thee before the Lord before my death. When God gives a promise, the biggest challenge for us as human beings is just to accept it and to believe it. And then stay out the way. <laughs> I repeat that. When God gives a promise, the biggest challenge for us is to accept it and believe it and just step aside. Just step aside. Because when we jump in, the fulfillment of God's promises jump out. We postpone, delay, derail the things that will take a day, it could become a year. Take a month, become a decade. You may forfeit a lifetime of woe and misery and receive sorrow. Parents, we must be careful not to have favorites. We must be careful because in this family there was favorites. Jacob loved Esau. He was a hunter. He was a man in the field. Rebecca loved Jacob. He communicated who was more at home. He was more gentle. But this division created strife. It was an undercurrent. I'm going to tell you what I think. The Bible doesn't say it, but patriarchs and prophets allude to it. It was almost like what's about to take place, what we're going to get into, is almost like Rebecca was anticipating this day and made preparations. Here we go. Verse 8. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Go now to the flock, fetch me thence two good kids of goats, and I will make thee a savory meat for thy father which he loved. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, and he shall eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. Now this is a conversation from mother to son. It takes two. <laughs> it takes two. Before sin was consummated in Genesis, early chapters, it wasn't consummated when Eve ate the fruit, it was consummated when Adam accepted the fruit that Eve ate. First, it takes two. Here, she offers and plants this, the concept of how this could be accomplished. Jacob, the son of Abraham, tongue in cheek a little bit, became the ancient ethical Ethan Hunt. Anybody know who that is? I love spy movies. I love all the spy. I, I read Tom Clancy novels, spy movies. I love them. Ethan Hunt is the character from Mission Impossible who wears all these masks and disguises. That's the character Tom Cruise plays a lot. Well, this is the first disguise in the Bible. The first one. For he disguised himself well. Unlike modern day technology, Tom Cruise's character could change his voice. He couldn't, but he did change his appearance well enough to fool his father. All these characters, he changed in appearance and style and mannerisms and favor to subdue your adversary. Very subtle to subdue your enemies. But Jacob was not completely fooled. 
He was deceived, but he wasn't completely fooled. He knew something wasn't quite right. Let's look at verses 26 and 29. No, let's back up a little bit. I'm sorry. Let's go to verse 19. Chapter 27, verse 19. And Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. It's interesting. You have to tell a lie to tell a lie. You understand where I'm going? It's easy to catch little kids when they get themselves in a trap. It's easy now. I see myself in my eye. I see him, man. <laughs> I see him. I can ask one question. Do you see him trying to worm out? He's like, and I like when he gets to the point, you know what, Daddy, I just, what I tell the kids at the, at the movie night, just say I'm sorry. He said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Jacob said unto his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn, the first lie. I've done according as thou bathest me. Arise, I pray thee. Sit and eat my venison, that thy soul may be blessed. And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly? How many guys here go hunting? I have uncles who go hunt. Okay. Now back then, I'm not sure if Esau hopped on a camel, rode a horse, well, he had to find the goat, kill the goat, drain the blood, dress it, season it, cook it. Now, I'm not sure if he had a campfire to get to 350 or 470, but I know he had to get a fire stroking. Okay? But because of his mother anticipating and knowing that her husband was about to die, had it prepared. She said, oh, What's his favorite thing? I got to have all these things around. He asked the question, how is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? He said, because, the second lie, the Lord thy God brought it to me. <laughs> now you're going to lie on the Lord now. You got to bring the Lord. See, that's just, that's deep. <laughs> you're going to bring the Lord into it now. You know what I'm saying? And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee, thy, my son, whether thou art my very son Esau. Even he has a doubt. My mother always tells me, she said, Junior, let me tell you something. I'm old, but I'm not slow. <laughs> that, that, that get me, get the, my back straight. What you said? She said, I'm old, but I'm not slow. I'm like, okay, mom, whatever you say, whatever you need. When we were kids, I used to call my mother Muhammad Sali. Okay. You, <laughs> because <laughs> cause when she said, it, you, you mean, you probably have parents like this, certain old school parents, you say it one time, they don't want to repeat themselves. It's like, they, I'm going to play with you, sister. Sister Simmons has the look. <laughs> She gives Brother Darius the look, but Archie got to ask him several times, but she just look, and you just stop. I understand that look. I'm 50-something years old. My mother gave me the look, and I still stop. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, okay, I got it. Trust me, fear is a good thing, just a little bit, like, like salt, just a little bit. Verse 22, and Jacob went near to his, Isaac, his father, and fell to him and said, here we go, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he discerned him not because his hands were hairy. And his brother Esau hands, so he blessed him. And he said, art thou my very son Esau? He said, I am. Three lies. And he said, bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat. 
And he brought him wine, and he drank. And his father Isaac said unto him, Come now, come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and smelt the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, Seeing the smell of my son, as the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, God, give thee of the dew of the heaven. Here we go. And the fatness of the earth and the plenty of the corn and wine. Let people serve thee and the nations bow down. This is the audible version. This is the promise of the birthright being given unto Jacob. And let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse thee every one that curses thee and bless thee he that blesses thee. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac, have mercy, verse 30, as soon as Isaac made an end to the blessing of Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac, what happened? Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. And he also made a savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto him, Father, let my father arise and eat of his son's venison that thy soul may be blessed. And Isaac's father said unto whom, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Esau trembled very exceedingly. Excuse me, Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that has taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten all before thou camest and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceedingly bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. What I haven't covered here is that Jacob had already tricked Esau verbally to give him his blessing. But see, Jacob was smooth because he realized ultimately that doesn't count. And Esau knew it didn't count either. He was like, hey, man, I'm hungry. Give me some food. I'll give you some food if you give me your birthright. Oh, it doesn't matter to me. I just want some food anyway. But did it count? No. It really didn't count. Esau knew it. But this is very devious. This is very deceitful. Because now there's consequences, grave consequences. Verse 35, and he says, And he said, Thy brother came with subtlety, and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is it not rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. That's the first time. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. You see, the blessing without the birthright is inconsequential. That's like having the world, world without having it notarized. You have people go to court all the time. Did, was that notarized? Was that witness? You may ask yourself, why couldn't Jacob then, Isaac, turn, turn around and just give the blessing to Esau? Why couldn't he? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Let's look at this real quickly. Keep your finger back in that book. We're going to pick up our, our speed here a little bit. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. Be careful when you swear an oath. Be careful when you make a promise. Be careful when you make a declaration. Verse 11, chapter 55, Isaiah. Please say amen when you have it. Amen. So shall my words be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me what? Void. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall what? Prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. He realized, oh my gracious, it's been done. It's been done. He's done it now. He's done it now. I can only imagine how Jacob felt. He had what he desired, but the way he obtained it, oh my gracious, it wasn't the right way. Jacob fled to Haran to save his life. Burdened with the feeling of sin, he pleaded with God for forgiveness. Have you ever sinned and done wrong and just wanted to run away and hide? 
Have you ever done wrong and just wanted to go someplace and somewhere in a place where no one knew who you were? You just said, let me just blend into the background. I just want to just, just, just be part of the scenery. Have you ever want to run and hide from yourself? You see a mirror, you just won't even look at yourself. He's like, no, no, I just want to keep going. But this was Jacob. He was on the run. He was a deceiver. He was on the run. He was a liar. He was on the run. He was a thief. Here's another movie reference. He was the first fugitive. He was the first fugitive. He was forced to leave his home. If you read the story, chapter 28, I'm not going to read every verse, Isaac called Jacob because he knew what he had done. You can read this for yourself. He said, basically, um, I'm going to take it out of the King's James Version to our modern vernacular. You can't stay here no more. You gots to go. Now, 30 or 40 years ago, I was strong enough to hold back your brother. I'm an old man now. I, I can't hold him back. You gots to go. Now, I'm going to give you safe passage. I'm not going to tell him where you went, but you can't stay here. You got to go. Pack up everything you have. Take your cam or a donkey. You got to go. <laughs> you can't sleep here tonight. You got to go. I love you, but you got to go. <laughs> What's so interesting, if you read chapter 28, and I know we have some unique Bible scholars here, some blessed Bible scholars. Jacob never apologized to his father. I, I didn't see it. Maybe someone else saw it. If they did, let me know. But I never see him say, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He never apologized. That's when you big and bad enough to think you can get away with anything. That, that's just, what do you call that? Bold. <laughs> Audacity. In my father's house, it's still my father's house, I was told never to raise my voice. When you walk through them doors, you don't raise your voice. Say it, say it loud. You in my house. This is all up in here is mine. You don't raise your voice. Junior Mac Knight was 19 years old. Came home from school. Had a nice little job was making some money, <laughs> smelling myself, <laughs> had my license, <laughs> was driving. I was a senior intern at Eastman Kodak, working for my godfather. I worked on the emulsion film system for something called the Kodak disc camera. I just knew I was the man. I was like, this is good. I got a little full of myself one day. And my voice was a little higher than what it should have been. I heard footsteps come through the house. And it moved swiftly. I saw my brother do the in the living room, and my brother was like shaking his head, and my older cousin was like, oh. And they, they quickly exited the room. I was like, what's going on? My pop stood by, my, by me, and he said, who are you talking to? Well, you see, I had to say to my, who are you talking to? And for 10 minutes, I was going, who are you talking to? 
And I quickly said, you know what? I'm about to get taken out. <laughs> I, I, I felt, I said, you know, it's been, I was 13 and a half years old, I believe, the last time I had a spanking. I was calculating. I was like, ooh, Lord. I said, my pops was like getting, he was getting swollen. He was like, <laughs> I started breathing deep. I was like, but daddy, he said, who are you talking to? I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. And quickly I said, what I told the kids, what I told the kids to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I quickly, I wouldn't believe it. I said, I, daddy, I'm sorry. This man never apologized to his father. This man had the audacity to come to his dad's tent. And I didn't read it. He didn't apologize. So Isaac said, you know what, you got to go. You can't stay here. I love you, but you have to raise up. You got to get out of here now. Verse 7 says, Jacob obeyed his father and mother and was gone put to Paderim. And Esau seen that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father. So basically he sent him away. I didn't get a spanking that day. Let me just tell you, let you know. Trust me. I apologize quick. And I kept saying it too. Kept saying it. I'm sorry. I'm telling all you young people, that's the get out of jail free card. I'm telling you, man. I'm sorry. Matter of fact, you may need to bend down and kneel down. And first I had to apologize to my mother. And you know what? Till that day, to this day, I never raised my, my voice in my mother's house. Never. My father's resting in Jesus now. He's asleep. His picture is in the house. When I walk in the house, I realize that this is my father's house. Jacob never apologized. I want you to understand this concept. Because what took place in Jacob's life for the next 20 years is not by accident. Jacob went out from his father's house. He went to Haran. You know what? In life, you can always meet somebody bigger, badder, and shrewder than yourself. You can meet somebody slicker than you are. <laughs> you can meet somebody as shrewd as you think you are. I'm not sure if you guys ever played basketball on the outside on the blacktop. But I grew up in the inner city. And when you play basketball on the blacktop, you got to bring it. Because someone always have more game than you do. Trust me. I take my son to the Y. He plays with the little kids and they play around. And sometimes he wins, sometimes he loses. I say, hey, man, you get better. I said, if I played against Kobe Bryant every day, I get better too. So a young man is his class. He was like, hey, Michael, come, let's play. He said, oh, daddy, I'm going to play with him. He always wins. But he wants you to be in your team so you can win too. Okay? Jacob now is in an environment where a deceiver is better at playing the game than he is. It took two. It took his mother to deceive his father. He's by himself. Now, I'm not sure if Heron, if Laban sent messages back home and says, why is my nephew here? The Bible doesn't say that. But he knew quickly he couldn't go home. Let me give you an old South Carolina phrase. You don't have to eat a whole cow to know that you're eating beef. You from North Carolina, you heard that saying before? Yes, the sisters nodding their head. You don't have to eat a whole cow to know you're eating beef. You eat a slice of, Nathan probably was asking questions. Well, how's my sister doing? How's your father? What's going on? And you know the short, the answer was short and quick. He was like, oh, wait a minute now. They didn't have cell phones back then. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Let me call home. Nope. You had to send a Perican Falcon with a little note on him. <laughs> Land. Why is he here? He deceived his father. Oh, my gracious. So he knew he had a prized possession. He worked for his wife. He worked. Jacob was troubled, and he was deeply tormented. I don't want you to think that he got away with it, because in some ways he did, but some ways he didn't. 
He's on his own. He's deeply troubled. He felt guilty for what he had done. He was a deceiver. He knew he lied to his father because he wanted the promise. He made a covenant. Let's look at um, Genesis chapter 28, verses 11 through, 25, um, 11 through 15. I'm going to read this to you. This is taken from The Wonderful Way. The Wonderful Way. It's a spirit of prophecy book, really, really old. It used to be a, 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 a church school book from my dad's library. I brought it here. It says, for 20 years, Jacob worked for his uncle. And often during that time, he was deceived concerning his wages and his family. Fear of his brother kept him from returning to his home until God in a dream told him to go. He would have stayed with Laban. Esau, powerful and warlike, went with several hundred armed men to meet Jacob. He always carried a company with him because he was looking for his brother. If Satan had his way, he could have killed the lion that would have brought Jesus Christ at the moment. Influenced by Satan, Esau could have destroyed him if God not over, had not overruled. Jacob was at the mercy of his brother. He thought of the sin he had driven, that driven him from his father's house and felt again the guilt that he had troubled him. Going apart from his household, he prayed for the assurance of God's forgiveness and protection. Let's look at Genesis chapter 28, 11 through 15. And Jacob went out from Beersheba, verse 10, and he went down towards Haran. On his way there, this is to Laban's house, he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heavens. And behold, the angels of God was ascending and descending on it. Ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land where on thou liest. To thee I will give it, and to thy seed. And in thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread it abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and I will keep thee in all places, whether thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken of thee. Patriarch and Prophet says that Jacob's heart was touched, even though he was riddled with guilt and torment. For he knew that God had not left him. But he hadn't felt forgiveness. He had not felt the complete assurance of God's acceptance, even though he heard the promise. He was there. Page Rocks and Prophets, page 184, said that God did this to let him know that I'm with you. And I've never left you. Sometimes in life what goes around comes around. Unfortunately. Let's reread our scripture reading here for a quick sec. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to pick up the last verses. Genesis chapter 32. Verse 12, and thou saidest, I will surely do good to thee, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, and they cannot be numbered for the multitude. It was at this time, a little bit before, let's go back, that Jacob was told, he worked for Laban for 20 years, and it come to a point where God told him, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go back to your father's house. Go back to your father's land.
Here we go. Verse chapter 29. And Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he was there. And now he had grown. He had been married. He married Leah first, tricked by Laban. Married her for seven years. He worked another seven years to earn the, the hand of the woman that he wanted to marry, Rachel. Fourteen years. And then he married, and then he worked another six or six and a half years before God came to him and said, you know what? It's time for you to go home. When you haven't been to your home, how do you feel when you return home? How do you feel when you go back to that place that you grew up? How do you feel when you go back to that place where you have fond memories, maybe bad memories at times? How do you feel? How do you feel when you're about to return to a place where your roots are planted and you've had all these experiences? Jacob now going through this in his mind. Jacob realizes that he has to make this track. He is about to go there. Now when Jacob left, he had nothing. But now he has two wives and several children. He has a whole company and band of people. Now he has what people consider wealth. But it wasn't completely free. Laban chased after him. Remember the story? He chased after him. He said, what have you done? You took my daughters, you took my grandkids, you took part of the things that I've given you. Chapter two, um, verse 25, Genesis 31, verse 25. Then Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the mount, and Laban and his brethren pitched in the mount of Gilgad. And Laban said to Jacob, What hast thou done, that thou hast stolen away unawares to me, and carried away my daughters as captive taken this, with the sword? Wherefore didst thou flee away secretly, and steal away from me, and didst not tell me, that I may have sent thee away with mirth, and with song, and with um, tambourine, and with harp? And hast thou suffered me to kiss my sons and my daughters? Thou hast, not done, thou hast done foolishly in doing so. It is in the power of the hand to do you hurt. This is what he told him. But before he got to Jacob, God got to him. Amen. God told him, said, now look, don't be foolish. This is my anointing. You got to understand, once you become a Christian, it's hard to realize this. God can forgive you of any of your sins, but you have to confess them. And you can't lay a hand on one of God's anointed so long as you stay anointed. That's a different sermon, but I'm not going to get into it. You must stay anointed. You can choose not to be anointed. You can choose not to believe. Jacob was foolish, but he wasn't a fool. Trust me, when that dream happened and the ladder ascended and descended, he realized, oh, my father, thank you, Jesus. I'm not sure if he called on Jesus, but I'm sure he said, thank you, God. There's hope. It is in my power, in my hand, to do you hurt. But the God of your father, interesting, he didn't say of our fathers. <laughs> the God of your father spake unto me yesterday night, saying, Thou take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. Now this I, I, I love I love this verse. Just don't touch him, don't even talk to him. Don't you like that? Don't just touch him. Don't even talk to him, either good or bad. I love it. And now thou, and now though thou wouldest needs be gone, because thou art, thou sore longest after thy father's house, yet wherefore hast thou stolen my gods? I'm not going to get into this, but Laban was an idol worshiper. Laban was an idol worshiper. So Jacob now steals away, and he's on his way. And Jacob is concerned, and he's nervous. Jacob is on his way back to his father's house. And he's realizing, oh my gracious, I'm going to have to now see my brother. And I'm not sure if he had intel, if he had scouts, he had people going before him. But he did, if you read the story. He had people who were left before him, and the scouts said, you know what? Your brother's bigger than he was when you last saw him. 
he travels with an entourage. Now, the Bible doesn't use that word, but I'm going to use that. He's traveled with an entourage. He has his boys with him. How many sons did he have? Oh, no, not them boys, big boys. I think he traveled about with 400 men. What? You could see the fear and trembling and sweat in this man's head. He's like, oh, my gracious, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I have no, I'm not a master of weapons like Esau. He hunts for a living. If you can kill an animal, you definitely can kill a man. When we last spoke, when I spoke to you a couple months ago, we learned that his grandfather sat expecting to see God. Remember that? He was sitting in the tent. He was expecting to see him. He was faithful. He was praying. He was waiting. Jacob now is in fear. Fear and faith work off of the same principles. I'm not sure if you know this. Fear and faith work off the same principles. You have to feed your faith or you can feed your fear. The reason why fear has such a grip on people is because Satan helps them. Because Satan will always remind you of the bad things you did. Oh man, you messed up, man. You about to go home now? You're going to get beat up. <laughs> Your brother going to whoop you behind. That's it. Ooh, man. Can you outrun him? No, he probably beat Jacob in every race. You know how you play tag and you run around as kids? He probably lost every race. Jacob working in the field as a shepherd, this man hunting, and he got 400 men with him? No way. So Jacob now separates his family into two. He says, if I get killed, maybe some of my family will live. The prayer, our theme for this year is prayer. And the prayer that Jacob prayed is probably one of the most powerful prayers in the Bible. Because it is a prayer of a person who knows that God knows that he knows he's guilty. Sometimes you watch some of these courtroom dramas and you hear the guy, the defendant trying to slither his way out with explain this and that, but it's different here. He knows that he's guilty. He's embarrassed to the hilt. He can't explain his way out. He's guilty. Verse 9, once again. He said, O Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord would said unto me, Return unto thy country and to go and to thy kindred. I will dwell good with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all of thy mercies, of all thy truth, which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I pass over this Jordan. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite thee, and the mother of, with the children. Remember, thou said, I will surely be do good to thee, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multiplied. Jacob prayed this prayer. He knew that tomorrow was the day. He knew that he would have to run the gauntlet. Now the gauntlet that we're describing here is when you're about to walk through a valley where you know you're going to be attacked. Enemies on both sides. When you run the gauntlet, your objective is just to survive, just to get through. Tattered, bruised, broken, beaten, you want to survive the day. All you want to do is survive. You want to get to the other side. He crossed over the Jordan, verse 30, 23, and he took them and sent them over the brook. He separated from his family now. Jacob was left alone. He was all by himself. Unlike his grandfather, waiting and expecting to see and receive God, he's by himself and he's overtaken by God. Verse 
Verse 24 says, And there he wrestled a man with him until the break of day. And he saw that he prevailed not against him. Have you ever been in a fight where you're just tired of fighting, but you can't stop fighting because you know if you stop fighting, you're going to be killed? The mental anguish of being in a fight. I was on a flight one time to Europe about 10, 15 years ago. And sitting next to me on this plane was the boxing manager of Muhammad Ali. He had every title ring that Muhammad Ali had won. You know when you win a Super Bowl, everybody on the team gets a ring? Well, boxing is the same way. Everybody in your company. He showed me pictures of Angelo Dundee, who was the trainer of Muhammad Ali down in Miami. He showed me pictures of his sparring partners, all these guys. He had every Super Bowl, every not Super Bowl, every boxing championship ring that he had on his hand. And I was asking him, I said, you know what? I said, this is amazing. So I started talking to him. I said, this is when Muhammad Ali was getting the Parkinson's. This is after the Atlanta Olympics when he was shaking, holding the, t the torch and the lantern. I said, what overtook him? He said, the last fight. He was fighting for his life. He said, he shouldn't have fought the last fight. He said, Muhammad Ali should have stopped. He said, if you talk, he said, he can write well, but his hand shakes miserably. He said, the mind is there, but he can't audibly tell you what he's thinking. He said, he's fighting for his life. He was just fighting in the ring. He said, he took too many blows to the head. And if you know anything about Muhammad Ali, he always kept his head up. He came with the term float like a butterfly, sting like a bee, because he floated away from punishment. Okay, he never got hit. He never took a real blow. But he said he took too many hits in that fight. He called it, this is the first time I heard this, a standing concussion. You get a concussion now, they take you out of the game. I think you have to go through a procedure now in base, um, football. They take you in the locker room. Muhammad Ali never completely showed those signs of system because he never really got hit. But in that fight, he said he got hit too many times. He did the rope adult. It cost him. He didn't get hit in the head, but he got hit. The last fight was Frazier, the thrill in Manila. It cost him. He won. Frazier looked like he got toe up. Muhammad Ali looked like he got bruised also. It cost him. Jacob's wrestling all night here. He's exhausted. He's mentally broken and beaten down. But he had the wherewithal to realize that I cannot let go. Verse 26, and he says, let me go. This is the, the angel says, for the day break, and he says, I will not let thee go, except you bless me. Have mercy. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said unto, and he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and has what? Prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. And I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. There are, there are rules and commandments that were broken before the Ten Commandments was in existence. There were rules and laws that were broken before Mount Sinai ever existed. And even though the Ten Commandments was not in place, he knew that he had done wrong. The first commandment, the greatest commandment, let's look this up, Matthew chapter 5, New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. Verse 43. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. 
ye have heard that if he have said, been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemies. But I say unto you, love thy, your enemies and bless them that curse you. And do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. And send his rain on the just and on the what? Unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans? Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So the Lord says, love your neighbor as yourself. Do unto them as you would want to be done. This man deceived his father. Not an enemy. Now someone who didn't love him or care for him, he didn't believe his father. You have to have audacity and boldness to go this far. But you see, he didn't escape. For that's the first and greatest commandment. Then we have the 10th commandment, but we also have the 12th commandment. As some theologian says, I heard C.D. Brooks says, a couple times I've heard him speak, he said, this is the 12th commandment. <laughs> Last year before we prepared to see... Um, Barry Black, I saw him a couple times. Barry Black used this too. He said, this is the 12th commandment. Let's go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians is after Acts, after Romans, after Corinthians, before Ephesians. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 7. Our time is running up here. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. So even though Jacob was blessed, look at what the price it cost him. He never saw his mother alive again. Huge price. Never saw his father alive again. Huge price. I can't imagine at 30-something years old, myself never seen my dad again, or my, father, my mother again. Cannot imagine that. Huge price. As we close out, let me tell you this. Each and every one of us who see Jesus come again is going to go through Jacob's trouble. We're going to have a time where we're separate, where we're wrestling and we're fighting and we're beating and we cannot let go. Because even though we've received the assurity that God has forgiven us of all our sins, we may in our own mind think, how can I be forgiven? I've done some bad things, some terrible things. Just before Christ comes the second time, the righteous will have an experience so much like Jacob's experience with the angel that is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Spirit of prophecy says that the righteous will face persecution and will plead earnestly for God's deliverance. Like Jacob, the righteous will remember their past experience. And unfortunately, the devil will help you remember your past experience. They will fear they have some unconfessed sin which separates them from God. Realizing their unworthiness, the righteous will acknowledge their dependence upon God and call for assurances of his care. All who desire the blessing of God, as did Jacob, will lay hold upon the promises. Jacob, in the spirit of prophecy, and Patrick's and prophecy, said he would repeat it over and over. He says, my sea shall be as the sands of the sea. Surely I will do good to thee. He recalled that he left Laban's house, and Laban told him, the God of your father says, do not speak good or bad to you and don't touch you. He recalled that even though he sinned and lied to his father, God had promised to be with them. He didn't say, how am I going to be with you? But he promised to be with them. Yeah. That same promise is for you and I. There's no sin so great that we cannot be retrieved. But you got to confess it. God doesn't want you to wallow in your sin. Jacob didn't leave his father's house and, and had a victory parade. I'm going to 
I'm going to tease on my little friend here. I love Fifth Avenue in New York and Broadway. You know why? That's where the championship parades take place. When my boys win. You can stand on Broadway and 8th Avenue, you can see the ticker tape. Nothing like it. Nothing like that other little city east of here. You know, they, they got tons of snow. They, it's not the same. <laughs> I love you, Linda. <laughs> but he didn't have a ticker tape parade. He obtained the victory he wanted, but he didn't have a parade. He had no celebration. There was no joy. There was no joy. Instantaneously, you knew, he knew he'd done wrong. When you see people win the championship, what do you see? You see them fall down, they cry, they salute their teammates, they're happy. There was no happiness here. I want you to think about this. As Archie plays, I want you to think about where do you go? Where do we go?
says nothing is more treacherous than the deceitfulness of sin it is the God of this world that deludes and blinds and leads to destruction Satan does not enter with his array of temptations at once he disguises these temptations with the semblance of good beguiles the souls to take one step then are prepared to take the next Oh, how Satan watches to see his bait taken so readily and to see souls walking in the very path he has prepared. There is a necessity for close examination and to closely investigate in the light of God's word. Am I sound or am I rotten at heart? Am I renewed in Christ? Or am I still carnal at heart with an outside, new dress put on? Rain yourself up to the tribunal of God and see as in the light of God if there is any secret sin, hidden sin, any iniquity, any idol that you have not sacrificed by prayer. Pray as you have never, ever prayed before that you may not be deluded by Satan's devices, that you may not be given up to heedless, careless, and a vain spirit. One of the sins that constitute one of the signs of the last days is that the professed Christians are lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Deal truly with your own souls. Search carefully. How few after faithful examination can look up to heaven and say, I am not a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God? How few can say, I am dead to the world, and when he who is my life shall appear, then shall I also appear unto him in glory. Love, the love of God and the love of God of grace, O oh, precious grace, more valuable than fine gold. It, it evaluates and ennobles the spirit beyond all other principles. It sets the hearts and affections upon heaven. While those around us may be engaged in worldly vanity, pleasure seeking, and folly, the conversation is in heaven. Whence we look for the Savior, the soul is reaching out to God for pardon and for peace, for righteousness and true holiness. Converse with God. Talk with God. Pray with God and contemplate all things about transforming souls into the likeness of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5, our last text of scripture says, examine yourselves to see whether you are holding to your faith. Test yourselves. Do you realize that Jesus is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. May God bless you. Please turn to hymn number 604. Shall we stand?
pray, dear God, that you will allow us to be on guard, to be watchful, to be prepared, and to anticipate your soon return. I pray that we're not caught napping, taking a break, or sleeping. But I pray that we'll be able to be a witness to others, to be that lamp, that lighthouse, to show others to the land of safety. I pray that we'll leave here inspired to get more into your word, to me more about your promises, how you've saved the faithful and the faithless, and how you've returned them all unto thee. For we pray in Jesus' name. Oh,